feeling lonely, wanting to find someone and not having found someone is like a chronic ache that doesn't go away. Finding love is one of the most universal things. It may be the most universal thing that we all want. Can't kill the desire for love. The desire for love is like the desire that a flower has for the sun and the rain. You can't kill it. I believe that there are some real important things that we have to do in order to find love. All of the nonsense of dating that comes with trying to find a person, the ghosting, the flaking, the hot and cold, the dating apps, texts that don't even result in a date, let alone a relationship. How good is it supposed to be? What does great actually look like in this area? Does it look like feeling great all the time? Does it look like being in love all the time? Does it look like the passion never diminishing? Does it look like peace? At what point should someone say, no, actually, it's pretty, this is pretty great. The past in your love life does not have to equal your future, no matter how long that past has been going for so far. Energetically, there's this kind of feeling of sanctuary, like, ah, oh, I'm home now. Of the eight billion people on this planet, we are the only person that is responsible for taking care of this human. Matthew Hussey. Aubrey Marcus. We're here. We're here. It's and good to be back. There's something that's changed since the last time we had a conversation. Do tell. You have a little proof of concept in your love life game <laughs> here. You can you you got a little proof of concept that you wear on your wear on your finger now. Finally, credibility. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> it works. I and don't you, have to justify my existence <laughs> in my career. <laughs> and your beautiful wife is here in the studio and uh what a I imagine this has been quite a journey for you to have been in the philosophy of this and of course the practice and your dating and all of the things that you're doing but now the real you know you're in a real crucible and so the illumination that's come from this you know i'm sure has poured into so much of the work and what you've written and everything that you've done so how's that how's that journey been to move from things that you've thought about to now oh you're living it i think it was a different journey than the one that i was taking people on in an earlier part of my career where I was like in a mode of trying to get people more opportunity in their love lives because that was something I knew how to do mm -hmm. in my own love life. I knew how to generate opportunity, but I didn't know how to be happy. Mm. And I didn't know how to find peace in that area of my life. And, and I hadn't found what I was looking for, if I even knew what I was looking for, but I certainly hadn't found like my person. Mm -hmm. And this, what's interesting about this book is like, this was, I'm married now. This was not a book written by a married person. It mm -hmm. was a, I, I, I was single writing this book. I found love during the process. And then the final edit I did of this book was on my honeymoon. Hmm. It's just really crazy. So there's so much in this book that, you know, was also me wrestling with and taking on my own challenges in my love life that, you know, I had struggled with for a long time, albeit behind the scenes, because it was a hard, I've, I didn't feel vulnerable enough or I didn't, I wasn't vulnerable enough in my career at a different stage to really talk about the ways that I was chronically dissatisfied in yeah. that area of my life. How many, how many people do you meet where you, whether they're single or with somebody where in the romantic category, they're like 10 out of 10 aces. This is the best. It's, this is the best it could be. Who is single or, or in relationship. Like, like full romantic satisfaction. Like, fuck yes. This part of my life is like, it's exactly what I was hoping for. Not a lot. Not a lot, right? Not a lot. And I, I, I think that should give people comfort. Yeah. Because I think so much of what makes people 
really unhappy single or feel even more unhappy when they're looking for love is that they're comparing themselves to what seems like a world of people who have figured it out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're basically not in a relationship wanting to find love, comparing ourselves to everyone who's in a relationship. And when you take that barometer and you say, how many people who are in relationships are happy, peaceful, feel like they're with the right person, and are even going to be with that person five or 10 years from now, then it starts to become a much smaller category. Yeah. And I actually think that, even though that sounds really pessimistic, it can offer people some comfort because you realize oh, I shouldn't be comparing myself to everyone in relationships. The actual, the actual number of people who are happy is much, much smaller. Well, and if you are comparing, compare to the truth, not the projection of what people are projecting because the social media projection of what a relationship is, you know, like you can watch, you know, you can watch your friend's Instagram relationship and be like, oh, they're doing great. And then, you know, next post later, conscious uncoupling post, <laughs> you know, and there's a huge gap between all of the bullshit they had to deal with and all of the, like the hell that they were going through. And then, so you go out with that buddy and you get some beers and you're like, yeah, it was fucking brutal, you know, but like the people don't actually project outwardly the difficulties of it. So you get this skewed perception and this 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 distorted reality uh, that you're comparing yourself to and it's it's hard out there it makes it so much worse i think it's why i just i love talking with people I, it's one of the reasons i truly love like real friendship where you sit down and you genuinely talk about your lives yeah. together because i always come away from those conversations feeling less alone Mm -hmm. I always have come away thinking and doesn't, whether it's in like relationships or whether it's in business or anything, anytime I sit down and actually talk with people, I'm like, no one knows what they're doing as much as it, I thought they knew what they're doing. Like in business, I'll literally, be, there'll be people I admire and I sit down with them and I, I connect and they're, they're like, yeah, I'm just trying to figure it out. Like, I'm just playing. I don't really know if this is going to work. I'm like, you know, I'll be looking at the thing going, this looks like a really good strategy, what you're doing. And they're like, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying it. Mm -hmm. And it, there's something about that that I've always found really, really comforting. And unfortunately, in our love lives, is it tends to be the area where we mask things the most. Yeah. Because people also don't want to admit it to themselves. You can have a friend in a really unhappy relationship who... It's like too much for them to even admit to themselves how unhappy they are because they may be really deep and it may be too much for them to admit like my partner is so difficult that I can't, I don't know how this is going to pan out over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's such a huge thing to realize. I remember being in an unhappy relationship and someone we both know leaving that I was, that she left me after having done like an interview with me and she went back to her sister afterwards. And I didn't know this at the time, but she left and she was like, he is not happy. Mm. And I didn't realize I was projecting any of that. Mm. I just, was clearly in a certain state that was unrecognizable to her. And she was like, he is not happy. But it's not like I was going to dinner with buddies that night talking about how bad it was. Yeah. You know, it, that I wasn't able to even admit that to myself. So when you even consider that, that people aren't even admitting to themselves what they're struggling with. So they're definitely not telling you. So we do have this very false picture of how everyone's doing. Yeah, I mean, I I bring guys over and we play basketball and, you know, in between the games, you know, when we've all sweat and we've all talked enough shit to each other and, you know, there'll be those little conversations in between and we'll, we'll get to hear some truths that'll come out. And it's just, you find that generally this is an area of people's lives where 
they it's it's not always working in the way that they you know hoped that it would and there's areas of their passion that have been extinguished and then there's some aspects that are there's there's a lot of different levers that have been pulled that have moved them off the course of what they feel like their best expression of their life would be but then they are kind of stuck in this trap where they're not they're not fully happy and i think what the what a relationship can be is like is the generator in the in the foundation for all of the rest of your life mm-hmm. right like it can be that solid point where it's like oh yeah i get to go back home and the relationship then then strengthens everything else in your life all too often it's the other way around though where it's like people have their life sorted out but their relationships are struggling and when that happens it's like the energy that that saps from you is terrifying like times of my life where i've been unhappy in that area when i look back at like my output in life or my creativity the what i was bringing to my family or to my friendships it was on the floor mm. and it you know it scares me to think what would that look like over a decade two decades you know when some when something that you're in is a vacuum for your best energy yeah and you're just trying to f- kind of like fight to emotionally stay alive or to try and be in a good place you're managing constant anxiety or constant chaos or constant guilt or constant stress or whatever it may be as a it's a hard place to be and it's i think the other thing is that people they i almost wonder if they're not sure how <coughs> happy they're supposed to be in this area of their life like is the level of happiness that they're aspiring to unrealistic Mm -hmm. is it something that they have to correct (coughs) can i grab some water please thanks there yeah thank you we have some still waters too if you need them oh that's good yeah they're they're wondering you know, it's easy to look at the couple that are, that seem like they're perfect or crazy in love and think, you know, that's that's a uh, is that a level I'm supposed to be aspiring to? I think there's a legitimate question around what's what's like enough. Mm-hmm. At what point should someone say, no, actually, it's pretty. This is pretty great, and it's. I think we're told a lot of stories about the way things should be. Some people do achieve that. Not everyone, we know that not everyone does achieve that. Not everyone even achieves finding a person, right? There are plenty of people out there in life who don't even find a mate to be with. So it's, it's this really, really tricky area where you have all these different levels of what look like happiness and love. And I think people get stuck going, how How good is it supposed to be? What does great actually look like in this area? Does it look like feeling great all the time? Does it look like being in love all the time? Does it look like the passion never diminishing? Does it look like peace? Does it look like content? Like what what does happiness mean? What does it look like for you? Oh man. I think it's a combination of it's a combination of peace, like real peace. Peace. Where I feel mm-hmm. at home, like I feel mm-hmm. home. The relationship becomes a sanctuary. I think that's a key, a key element where energetically there's a, there's this kind of feeling of sanctuary, like, ah, I'm home now. That's exactly I can drop right. all the, drop everything else. It's like I can cry if I want to, shit if I want to, laugh if I want to, scream if I want. Like I'm home now. Yeah, you know, like 
I'm home. That's a that's a big that's a big part. That's that was huge for me. Yeah. But I I it took me a minute to realize that was the feeling I was having. Mm -hmm. Like in my relationship now, it took me a minute to see that I wasn't being judged, that I was being truly accepted for who I was, that I was able to be vulnerable on a whole different level. Because in the beginning, I wasn't even really, I was still not being vulnerable in a lot of ways. I was still holding a lot back, like, so, like showing, you know, I always think with vulnerability, we, we don't all have the same idea of what vulnerability is. Like, I used to think vulnerability was telling stories about how hard things maybe were for me at some stage. But then I realized there's nothing vulnerable about those stories, really. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's the the world is full of like rags to riches stories or pain to you know success stories of whatever kind. The self development world is full of those like before and afters. They're not really vulnerability. They're like when you tell a hero's journey story, it's really a story about how awesome you are. Mm. It's not a story of how I am still, I have this piece of me that if I tell you about it, I think you're going to look at me differently. You're going to, I, there's, I'm going to feel so much shame and you're going to think I'm ugly. You're not going to think I'm as attractive. You're going to think I'm insecure. Like that to me is vulnerability is the thing that there's a, there's some risk to it because mm -hmm. you really are afraid that someone might not accept you yeah it's easy to tell the hero's journey story of your life and pass it off as vulnerability but that's a story of how you you used to have it hard and look how impressive you are you got through it i think a lot of people wait until they've gotten to the outcome of moving through the challenge mm. to then be able to tell the story with the happy ending not tell the story in the middle of the story when the st when the when the ending hasn't been written yet yeah while they're still on the tightrope while they're exactly and that's i think that's exactly what you're pointing to is that oh yeah it's easy to say oh we went through some trials and then we had a we had a death lodge ceremony and then everything was so beautiful on the other side no no talk to me in the death lodge ceremony talk to me when you think that the relationship is going to be over. Mm -hmm. You think all is lost. You think that you just can't go on anymore. Like that's the real, that's the real actual vulnerability is the, is the present moment that I think is, you know, uh, should be encouraged to be shared um, in your intimate circle. Cause like letting people into those truths we all have those we all have those moments and we don't need to whitewash it with a good story of how oh and it all worked out like no no no. like it's okay to just be in the shit i'm just in it i'm just in the shit in the shit of it that's a that's a that's something that i it took me a while to learn i feel like i was was i late bloomer in that department i certainly was like not good at it at a time when I probably thought I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And it only in the last few years have I really started to show m more of myself in a way that's felt risky or felt like scary. Even yeah. podcasts where I'm like, I talk and then at the end of it, I go home and I'm like, I feel anxious. <laughs> I don't know if I should have said that or talked about that or, you know, and I'm not as someone who thinks, you know, like there's definitely, you know, there's times where it's possible to overshare. It's not like we should go on a first date and just like, yeah, here's all sure. of my demons. But, but I was on the wrong side of that for, for a while. And, and I, it's been an interesting experience for me in the, these last few years to just embrace being more and more of myself, like the meest me and Audrey, 
my wife has been a huge, huge like healing presence in my life for that because the things that I thought would make me unlovable or unattractive to her that I hadn't really truly shared with people before I felt accepted mm -hmm. and that was like it was a very corrective kind of experience mm -hmm. for me yeah I found in my own you know I I think really deeply about the things that I speak in relationship the the actions that I take in I've developed a level of courage I would say to look at the places where I've been manipulative or deceptive in, in a subtle way, hmm. where I tried to engineer a situation yeah. and I'll catch myself and I'll go, oh, there you are, you're an asshole. Like, you didn't need to do that. Like that was, that was, that was selfish. Like you'll actually. catch yourself in the present doing it or you'll catch or yourself, I'll, you'll look back I'll on look time. Back, I'll look back at it, but I, but I'm willing to actually, I think I'm more willing to actually say, no, yeah, I, you were, you were being a dick. You were being selfish, you know, and really to like analyze that and to own that, the part of me that's, that, that can be can be bad and can be selfish and can be kind of like can drive drive a situation and try and steer it more than actually it wants to be. How do you do that? How, I'm curious what you do with this because how do you stop yourself from veering from that to, and therefore I'm a bad person because I know in my life, that's something I've struggled with where I think if I did try to manipulate a situation or if I did try to, like if I did something that I look back on with some like shame or I'm like, there was a level of, I don't know, something in there that I just don't like, I, that my brain can go to, that's right, I'm a bad person. Mm-hmm. So yeah. as opposed to like, that was a selfish moment or that was a selfish, you know, you did a selfish thing or you did a slightly, you know, like manipulative thing and trying to engineer a situation to your benefit or whatever. But how do you stop short of thinking you're a bad person? Because I know I'm a bad person and a good person. I'm both. Mm -hmm. I like, I've really looked inside and said, oh yeah. Oh yeah, there's bad in here. There's bad in here. There's selfishness in here. There's there's a way in which I can be, there's a selfish impulse, a drive from the separate self that doesn't isn't connected to the field, doesn't thinks that prioritizes my feelings and my pleasure and my experience above everybody else's. And that part, you know, that part is bad. And there's there's that part of me that exists. And it's always there. Mm. It's always there. But it's the choice, it's the choices I make to be better that allow that allow me to actually navigate along that continuum and to become better. But so how I do it is I go, yeah, I'm bad. I'm bad. And I'm good. And I'm really good. So it's this full integration of all these parts of yourself instead of needing for it to be one truth that you're constantly in battle between am I good, am I bad? It, it's a complete holistic. Yeah, I'm good and bad. And it's almost like those two options are in quantum superposition, right? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? What's going to manifest? What's going to actualize through myself? Is it my goodness or is it actually some of my badness, some of my selfishness that's going to actually come through here? And to just be comfortable with the fact that know when, all right, yeah, that was bad. And this is, this is good. And this is really good. And I, I think I've just developed more comfort in that without the shame. So, cause what happens is, is if you're ashamed mm -hmm. of the bad parts, then you'll trick yourself into thinking that you didn't do anything bad after all. Right, like you'll, you'll find all of these ways to justify what you did and this is what was happening and then, and then you'll kind of exile that part of you. And, but just to 
really hold all of it, the full spectrum of who I am, all the bad and all the good. I think that's probably been the most helpful process for me and also helpful in my relationship to just be willing to go like, yeah, yeah, that was bad. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, like, 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 yeah, you know, that was fucked up, you know, and, and that's been a, that's been a real journey because I had a very harsh inner critic that would, was really tough on myself when I would do something bad. And cause I didn't want to be bad. I don't, I don't want to be bad. I don't want to, I want to be good and I'll slip and I'll fall and I'll be selfish. And, but the more, the more that I'm like soft with that level of judgment in myself and loving to that part of myself, the easier it is to kind of navigate and to really know and not really have to defend, you know, if, if like, if some, if something's called out, like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah. That was bad. Mm-hmm. You know? And here's my, here's my goodness. The and is so important. Yeah. The and it's, uh, I think that's the, that's the huge link for me is it's possible like multiple things are true but this this one that you fear where you know because the ang- the anxiety is that no but this is the truth like mm-hmm. the bad is the mm-hmm. truth of who i am or the, the mm-hmm. or the weak is the truth of who i am or the whatever it may be and i think that's the the and and the full holistic view of yourself that that then gives way to Mm -hmm. i think is is very very powerful and it stops you from you know i I love that idea that that you accepting that yes sometimes i'm bad is there's a humility that then comes with that right because it makes it easy to apologize yeah it makes it easy to just own things when you can't have that be true, yeah, then you're it's actually a, a really difficult person to be with because you can't. You then are distorting reality all the time. Yeah, and now you're into like you know making someone question their reality because you just can't allow for that situation to have made you in that moment bad. Right. That's where it gets really, really bad, like really toxic. And and this is all the whole gaslighting phenomenon yeah. where you're like, where if you cannot accept your own badness and that you may have acted selfishly and you may have acted in a, in a wrong way and you can't just own that and be comfortable with that being an aspect of your expression, the arguments and the, and the conflicts that you'll have, they'll just never fully resolve and and you'll just build more and more tension yeah no and and you know with people who are truly narcissistic you have like someone who will happily make you question your sanity before they'll ever yeah allow themselves to be bad because it's just too (laughs) you know their identity structure cannot hold cannot hold that they've ever done something wrong yeah they cannot hold that an that an impulse this darker selfish impulse came out an impulse to actually hurt you and an impulse like i feel pain i want to hurt you all right well that's a that's a normal actual animalistic response you know we find it in the we were just talking about fighting before we we came on this boxing and kickboxing you know someone hits you with a good shot there's a natural reaction to like Oh, I'm gonna hit you back, motherfucker. Like, all right, that's a that's an there's an animalistic part that sometimes can come out in your love life and to your lovers. Mm-hmm. And you have to be able to say, like, shit, like I'm sorry, like that that part of me came out and like I, and hopefully catch it before it actually does its damage, right? Like hopefully you want to be able be aware of it and to mitigate it. And this isn't just a carte blanche. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm bad. And you know, like <laughs> I just do whatever you want know, to, you want to you wanna navigate yourself in that way, but to understand that there's a, there's a kind of a soil, a soil from which all of these, you know, 
sins can come from. Mm. <laughs> and there's the, this soil is part of the humus, the earth of, of the human, of who we are. And then like, if we know that like the humus, the earth, the soil contains, contains some of this energy, it's like, okay, okay, I, I'm sorry and I'll be better next time. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's having, having, a, it's, it requires a level of self-acceptance mm -hmm. to do that. Like, you, you kind of have to have, in many ways, accepted yourself first, which is such a hard thing. Like, when I think about how much we carry around from our lives, and for me, for a long time, I used to carry around such regret around decisions or around things I wish I'd done differently, you know, pain that I'd caused in some way. Um, mostly the pain I'd caused myself. Like I used to, when I thought like decisions or actions I took that hurt me or wasted time or, you know, that I would, I would really carry that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, not everyone does that to the same extent. Like I know people who just don't beat themselves up very much. They're just gifted. <laughs> <laughs> they, They're like Forrest Gump. <laughs> you know, like it's like, that's like a Forrest Gump trait where if if you don't have that, <laughs> that no, part they they like get, yeah, up, yeah, it's amazing. They, it's amazing. You're like they're like, oh, yeah, I didn't do that, and I'm like, I can't relate to you at all. I I spent my whole life beating myself up, so this is like, you know, we're on. I I have to have such robust tools for dealing with that because it's. It's something I dealt with for a very long time. And it took me a long time. You know, when I think of things that took me years to like forgive myself for or to move past and, you know, learning, I mean, I have, I have frames, I have like paradigms that I taught myself that were very helpful to me, that were very useful for self-forgiveness, but you know, everything you're saying is also just another route to that self-forgiveness. Yeah. Because you are just, you're just making space for the fact that we're complicated. Mm -hmm. Who was the person, did you have an avatar in mind when you wrote this book, Love Life? Who was the person that you were writing this book to? What were they dealing with? What was going on in their life? They... Okay, there was a, a woman who came to me who said at the beginning of our session, this was the very first thing she said to me, and bear in mind all the things you would assume someone would ask me when they first are with me. She said, I want your help. I need to learn how to kill this hope that I have to find someone. Well, wow. Because it's not working out for me. And it's making me so sad. And when I see my friends and people around me who have, who have found love, I think that's amazing for them. And I'm happy for them, but at the same time, like I'm truly jealous. I don't wish them bad. I, I just, I'm so jealous because I want that for myself so badly. And it brings me pain to see this thing that is so elusive to me and has never worked out for me and to be confronted with it. And she said, I don't want to feel like that. And she said, I'm, if I never meet someone, I'll be sad for the rest of my life if I hold on to this hope, this desire to meet someone. So can you help me kill the desire so that at least I can enjoy my life? And that may not be the, the kind of average 
avatar for this book. This book will deal with people who are all, at all different levels of wanting to find love. And some of them may be in a much more hopeful part of their journey of wanting to find love and just wanting to learn how to do love better. Mm-hmm. But the the reality is finding love is one of the most universal things. It may be the most universal thing that we all want. And it is hard. And it makes people really, really unhappy when they want it badly. And they've told themselves that this is a fundamental part of my life vision and what I'm excited about or what I think is going to make me happy in life. And it's not working out for me. And then over time, they see friends disappearing into relationships who are no longer there to hang out with in the same way and become increasingly unrelatable. And the older people get, often the more invisible they feel. And they're still dealing with all of the nonsense of dating that comes with trying to find a person, the ghosting, the flaking, the hot and cold, the dating apps, texts that don't even result in a date, let alone a relationship and situationships that never turn into someone saying, I'm ready. I want to do this. People always feeling like they're the, the person after the, or the person before the person that mm. someone marries. And they live with a kind of chronic pain. Mm. And I wrote this book to first show people how to do love better and how they can, you know, I, I believe that there are some real important things that we have to do in order to find love and some real important things we have to avoid in order to find love. But I also wanted to address the real feelings that people have about this area of their life, which is that feeling lonely wanting to find someone and not having found someone is like a chronic ache that doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. And how do you, how do you deal with that so that you're not deferring your happiness to a time when you do find it? And how at the same time do you do the things that might help you find it faster than you are right now? That, that was who this book is for. How did you respond to that woman? who wanted to kill that desire because you, I, I imagine that you can't kill that desire. You can't kill the desire for love. The desire for love is like the desire for, uh, that a flower has for the sun and the rain. You can't kill it. <laughs> it's just going to be there, you know, like it's, it's unavoidable. So, so I'm sure you had to channel that in a different way. What was your strategy? I, I, one of the things I write about in this book, which is an, an unexpected thing in a book about how to find love, uh, was my own chronic physical pain. Yeah. And how I, I had my own encounter with something I felt I couldn't make go away for many years. Uh, you know, I got tinnitus where my I had ringing in my ears. You and I have talked about this, you know, and I, it didn't go away and that freaked me out and doctors told me it'll go away in six months and then when it didn't go away in six months it you know panic set in and i'd wake up every night and pray that when i woke up it had gone away and i'd then hear the loud ringing as soon as i woke up and it ruined silence for me, which was something I loved. <laughs> mm. I no longer enjoyed silence. Meditation was just ringing in my ears whenever I was trying to meditate. And that made me think I'm never going to be able to do this right, which is ironic uh, with meditation. Um, but I, I truly never stopped thinking about it ever. And then that morphed into um, all sorts of other symptoms from dizziness, pain in my ear, pain in my head behind my eye a buzzing sensation in my head it just started like like it was like developing into a whole series of chronic sensations that for a long time made my life a misery and 
I didn't know how I, I truly, I, I did everything to try and get rid of this. Like, you know, when something's, when something's ruining your life like that, it becomes your number one motivation is to do anything I can to get out of this. And I, I went in search of everything that could make a difference. Uh, every kind of therapist and acupuncturist and, you know, uh, doctor, I threw everything at it. I flew to Germany in the middle of COVID to try to, you know, get a um, plasma taken from my blood and injected into parts of my head and my ear to try to figure that and that didn't work and I spent an ungodly amount of money <laughs> trying to mm -hmm. fix this thing nothing nothing moved the needle at all and um and I reached a, a sense of utter hopelessness uh, I went to a therapist and I said to him I, I'm I'm gonna live for other people from now on um because I'm never gonna be happy again so long as this is here I'm never gonna be happy again and I can't make it go away. So I'm never going to be happy again. I, I get no joy from my life anymore. This is all I think about is my, my physical pain. And, um, and I was lucky, actually. I was lucky that I had a lot of responsibility. And, you know, I had family and team and people that relied on me. And it all, you know, it gave me something to focus on. It gave, you know, the people I was working with that I was coaching, it gave me something to focus on, but it was, none of it was for me anymore. Um, it got really, really, really dark. And I had to start to look for other tools that didn't involve fixing it. And I learned some, you know, I developed my own little like toolbox for how to manage this thing. And every tool in that box came back down to one central premise, which was there is the physical pain I'm experiencing, as well as the ringing in my ears. That is a fact that wherever it comes from, whatever's, wherever it's originating from, the pain is real. But there's also my relationship with this pain mm -hmm. and that part i can't i do not know how to control this part i've tried everything but this part is making it a thousand times worse how i am relating to this is creating utter hell on earth for me right now and so how do i manipulate my relationship with this thing what's the leverage I have. And then it came down to a number of things and, and I can go through those, but every single one of these relates precisely to that woman in her situation. Because when she went to bed at night and, you know, I talked to her about this, you know, I said, when do you feel it? So I go to bed at night, I lay in the dark, I look up at the ceiling and I feel this feeling in my stomach, this loneliness. And I said, okay, so let's start with the fact that that loneliness you're feeling is a feeling. And that feeling itself is deeply uncomfortable. By the way, so is getting stung by a bee, All right? If a bee came in here right now and stung one of us, it would hurt, but our relationship with it wouldn't be a fraught one. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't start going, "We're what a piece of shit I am for leaving the window open where a bee could come in. I'm such an idiot for not being on guard. Mm -hmm. Like, what you know, I'm a moron. This is, I've always been a moron, come to think of it. Like, it's like, we wouldn't do that. You just go, that sucks. A bee stung me. Sure. The hell? And that, feeling in your stomach, that loneliness is also just another sensation. What turns it into way more than that is the relationship you have with that sensation. For me, in my physical pain, I had a, a story that my life was over and that 
I would never be able to enjoy anything again. I remember working with a coach who I was part of what I was lamenting at the time during this time was like things I used to enjoy eating and drinking. I just couldn't eat and drink anymore without making everything even worse. And I love food and I like a cocktail. I'm not a big drinker, but like I'm a person who I just like life. This is one of the things that really hurt. Like at the time I was like, I fucking love life. Mm -hmm. This is robbing me of who I am. I'm no longer who I am anymore with this thing. And I was lamenting the fact that I couldn't even have a sip of wine or I couldn't eat, you know, this food or whatever. And this coach said to me, look, we don't know. Like I was saying, I can never have a sip of wine again now, blah, blah, blah. She was like, we don't know where this is going to be in five years. We have no idea. All we know is that right now, these things seem to aggravate it. So let's lose the ceremony and just focus on removing some of these things right now. And then we'll reassess. And that phrase, lose the ceremony, became a very key phrase for me because it got me out of this catastrophic thinking of this is what all of this means and this is me projecting it out to the next 10 and 20 and 30 years. Everything changes. Mm. Everything changes. You know, your body can change, how you feel can change, or... I might change the way I feel about this thing. I might no longer, how I feel about it today will also change, even if the pain doesn't. And at a certain point, those almost end up becoming the same thing. So it all changes. And I started to, you know, this is two of, you know, seven different things I put in the book about what I did about my physical chronic pain. But I started using all of them all the time as a way to have a completely different relationship with this thing that did not have all of the story that I attached to it that started to create a completely different level of surrender to this thing. And it, and it truly changed the game for me. I like it. It was the most it for me it was the most kind of spiritual experience of my life was this thing i was a type a person who was used to working my way out of every problem i ever had like grinding out of any situation i was in and i could not grind my way out of this one and it was my my biggest first encounter with something that made me truly unhappy that i couldn't change so to go back to your relationship <clears throat> to hope then, because hope is, <laughs> you know, Dante's Inferno. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. There's actually some interesting, interesting wisdom in that because hope in a place where there is only suffering and pain in the Inferno, hope is another form of pain because you're projecting this, oh, well, I'm hoping that uh, this is going to go away and then it's not, and then the disappointment and then that constant thing. So the abandonment of hope is one potential strategy. And at the same time, you still have to hold a vision of the future. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Joe Dispenza would say, like hold a vision of the future and draw that vision of the future closer to you so you can't let go of a memory of a future where this thing is healed and you can't be subject to the vicissitudes of dealing with hope and the disappointment as that hope goes so how did you deal with hope yourself like oh man i hope i wake up in this and then the disappointment how did you deal with that that's such a that's such a great question man it's such a great question I, uh, no one's ever asked me that. Um, it's funny because that that story, Dante's Inferno, this is a, the story of Pandora, is an interesting one because when she opens the box, or the, it was actually a jar that she opened, but when mm. she opens it and all of these afflictions fly out to plague mankind, the when she closes it out of horror. 
the one that's still in the jar is hope. And there's an interpretation of that story that says that actually the one grace for mankind was that hope stayed in the jar. Because hope was the worst of all of them. <laughs> yeah. The idea that in a world where it's not going to get better, <laughs> it's going to get better is the worst kind of torture. And, and so I know for me, the way that played out was that anytime I would have a new appointment for some treatment or doctor or fan, like some out there thing that could help every time I used to get my hopes up, even just having a date in the diary for a treatment felt like a kind of relief. Like, uh, it was almost like my pain for a brief moment got better. Just knowing that there was something coming up that was going to treat it. I relaxed, which is by the way, I think, you know, the same as a lot of people feel when they go on a promising date, mm -hmm. they go tell all their friends. It was an amazing date. And for a moment, it feels like I can relax because, ah, like hope again, you know, yeah. but when it didn't help me. When a week later I was feeling the same symptoms, the crash for me was terrible. Like I, I, it, it was like I would sink even lower. And again, that's what happens to people in their love lives, right? It, is, it was going somewhere and then this person doesn't call me back. Now they're not texting me anymore. So for me, it, it wasn't about me telling myself that it will never get better. But it was a kind of total surrender to the, to the way that it is now and not living for the day when it did potentially get better. Mm -hmm. Like I had to make space for the possibility and even do certain things that I thought might if, if there, if there was legitimately something that came along that I thought could make a difference, then okay. But I, I really had to surrender to, to how it was. And I had to make space for possibilities, but, but also truly just make peace with the fact that it was almost, it almost became a, a kind of game to me where it's like, if this never changed, could I get to a place where I'm happy enough? Like right, you know, until that point, I had just been miserable. So it became, could I, could I get to happy enough? Because happy enough is a powerful place to be. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. You get to happy enough, you can start to make an impact in your life again. When, when you're not happy enough, you, you, your life starts to contract and you, and you hide away. You can't get out of bed. You don't want to socialize. You don't want to create things. You don't want to work hard. But when, when you're happy enough, you can start to make some magic in your life again. And you might actually find that upward momentum you need to go beyond happy enough. So for me, my goal became happy enough. And that became my own kind of beauty was arriving in that place and being grateful to be happy enough to be grateful to be in a place where I was no longer constantly suffering. Yeah. And then, and, and to be, and to, and to just stay curious, like I, curiosity for me became a really important word. Just, just stay curious, not, ho not hopeful necessarily, but just stay, stay curious Stay humble. Don't think you know everything about everything. Just, just make space for possibility. Mm -hmm. That that was a that was a big one for me because there is a there is an there is a kind of arrogance in thinking that we know that we know that it's never going to get better. That we know because of our past history with love that we're never going to find love, that no one's ever going to come through the door, that it, we're never going to be able to operate differently in our lives, or we're never going to feel differently about this thing. 
I've been humbled enough times in my life where I thought nothing was ever going to be different or this situation is never going to change or I'm never going to get over this one. I've had that situation enough times to have massive humility that I am not a good predictor of how something is going to feel five years from now or how much it's still going to bother me five years from now or how stagnant or the, the same that thing is going to stay five years from now. I've been humbled so many times that I can't not leave room for the, for the curiosity of, I don't know. Yeah. Give God a chance. That's a, that's a saying that I have, like God always has cards <clears throat> and that's the humility of it is, you know, God is a loaded word for a lot of people because it means a lot of things. But to me, it's the mystery. Mm. God, the mystery always has cards, always has cards. Like there's never a place where God doesn't have cards. And so when I find myself in those places of hopelessness, because while hope can be painful, hopelessness is also like inc oh, yeah. incredibly, incredibly devastating, right? So it's yeah. the double-edged sword of like the the pain of of the hope and 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 failing to meet the hopes that you get and the disappointments, but then the place of hopelessness is no place to live no. either. So you can't live there. So it's like this radical acceptance of where you are and then filling that with as much gratitude as you can for the situation that you're in and knowing that, you know, God still has cards. The mystery is yet to unfold, not moving to the catastrophic thinking and, and it takes a kind of rigor of the psyche to stay on that path of acceptance, surrender, gratitude, and, 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 then, and then being aware of the pitfalls where, man, maybe I should just fucking end my life. I'm like, maybe I should just fucking end it, you know? Yeah, you have to be, that's, I think that that's a, those are peaks of intensity that we have to be really careful of because there's, you know, I, I always think the most dangerous emotion is overwhelm. Like that's the one to really be careful of. Anger, it comes in different forms. You, sometimes you can use it for good. Sometimes, you know, not, but it, you can, you can figure out a way to use anger, sadness, depression, anxiety, all of these things that we think are like bad emotions, none of them are truly dangerous until they reach a crescendo. And the crescendo is when it, when you get to overwhelm, you're overwhelmed with anxiety, you're overwhelmed with anger, you're overwhelmed with depression. You, when you get to overwhelm, that's, that's when we want to check out or when we think it's all too much and i i try to make it my mission in life to avoid any of the negative emotions ever reaching a point of overwhelm being very vigilant for what takes them to the point of overwhelm mm. um and and you know you said god has cards you know, we, we have some cards too. And one of those cards is to at any point in our life, always be willing to make plan B the new plan A. And if it's plan C, then make plan C the new plan A. That is one of the most creative things you can ever do in life. Like that's a pure creation when you can take plan B and make it the new plan A. Mm -hmm. And we do that first by leaning into the circumstances and what's something special I could only do from this particular place. There's a, a s experiment I got told about by a psychologist with rats where rat A was allowed to run on a wheel and rat B was on a wheel that was hooked up to rat A's wheel. So whenever rat A ran, rat B had to run. 
And at the end of the experiment, rat A showed all of the positive markers of exercise. And rat B showed all of the negative markers of stress. Hmm. Both doing the exact same amount of exercise, same amount of exertion. But rat A chose to run. Hmm. And rat B didn't. So much of life to me is in that idea that we're all doing running in our life. We're all doing something difficult. And by the way, like, let's not forget that we all choose difficult things to do in life. You know, people choose to climb mountains. They choose to build a business. They choose to write a book. Like we do, we choose to do these difficult things. We choose to go to the gym. This is all pain that we opt for. Who said that the pain we opt for is any more beneficial than the pain we didn't opt for? I would argue the pain I didn't opt for has been more valuable to me uh-huh. than the pain I've opted for. So for me, I like to have, I like to do a little uh, like thought exercise where I imagine the really painful things in my life, maybe the things that I wish would change or I wish hadn't happened. And I, I imagine them on a menu. And next to the pain on the menu is all of the unique benefits that I can only get from this particular pain. Mm-hmm. And each item gives me specific benefits that can only come from this particular pain on this day or this year or this part of my life. And, the, and I imagine with the pain that I didn't choose, I imagine myself choosing that pain going, well, I really want those items. So I'm going to choose this pain the same way I would choose to do something difficult, like write a book. I'm choosing this pain. And by doing that, you are proactively turning yourself from rat B to rat A. Yeah. You're now deciding to run this race or to to run on this wheel. And when we do that, when we stop being a victim of this thing that's happening to us and we now go, okay, I'm choosing this thing. I'm choosing these benefits that I can only get by coming through this or by dealing with this, even if I never come through it, then there's a, there's a true power to that. And, and I think that's how we end up creating a masterpiece is we, we do like that. Did you, I've never watched it, but I watched five minutes of it and instantly I gleaned some idea from it. Have you ever watched the TV show Chopped? No. Right. I, I haven't either, but I remember being in a dentist chair and it being on the TV and seeing like the first five minutes. And the concept is just these chefs get given a basket of ingredients and they have like 20 minutes to do something with those ingredients. And in this one episode I saw, they got like a finger lime, an Alaskan king crab, and kelp jerky. (laughs) Now, obviously, everyone's like, the Alaskan king crabs, there's a great ingredient. No one's looking at the kelp jerky thinking, thank God I got the kelp jerky. Like, that's going to come in super useful. But... The show isn't a, ba- it's not like the show is now everyone open their basket ingredient of ingredients. Oh, you got the good ones. You got the bad ones. Okay. You win. That's not the show. The show is. What do you make of it? What do you do in those 20 minutes? That's the show. Isn't about ingredients. The show is about chefs. Yeah. <clears throat> and that, that should give people some real comfort. I think because we, we, all get different ingredients and some of our ingredients really suck and it's not like i think that we do the wrong thing by trying to get ourselves to love our ingredients like I, you you may not love your ingredients you there's maybe certain ingredients that it's just hard to love but and that, that might be you what's your kelp jerky but it's easy to love the chef who can do something interesting with kelp jerky mm-hmm. so that for me has been been a very transformational idea because anyone can take that and say, you know what, I've been spending so much time wishing for different ingredients instead of thinking, you know, how good of a chef could I become? Have you ever heard of the <coughs> rebel Zen monk Ikkyu Sojin? No. 
Tell me. He was this rebellious monk who said he could learn more from an hour in a brothel than his fellow Zen brothers would learn from a year on a meditation cushion. He was this, this wild, erotic Zen monk. And Ikkyu Sojin had a quote, and it was, throw me into hell and I'll find a way to enjoy it. And he was, that's exactly what you're talking about. He's like, serve me up these ingredients. I'm a Zen master. I'm going to find the way to enjoy this dish that life has served. Like I'm going to, he had so much confidence in his ability to be able to take any ingredients and make it into a dish and actually enjoy that dish, you know? And, and that's, Mm -hmm. that's master level. That's master level living. That's like, that's being the artist of your life. And, And when you are that artist, the, I think the, the great irony is, that's that's when people begin to notice you differently because you you start to become very intriguing to people you that even if you never talk about the thing that has made you that person or the pain that you've gone through like i like i know i for a long time when i was dealing with my own pain my physical pain i didn't talk about it like I'm talking about it today, but when I was trying to wrestle with it, I felt like I couldn't talk about it because it was too, I couldn't face the idea that people would keep reminding me of it. Yeah. So I didn't talk about it, but there was a different depth to me while I was going through that and I was wrestling with it and trying to navigate my relationship with it. And it added a layer to my work. It added the depth to my work and the way people were noticing what I was doing. People could, they didn't know where it was coming from, but there was a an added level of interest. And that's no less true in our love lives. When people get to a point where they've found a place of calm or peace, where they've, the kind of, the person that's emerged out of that is has a particular kind of strength or a playfulness that they're able to now have because they're no longer in fear so now they're able to actually be playful again it's like you now you you actually might find yourself getting noticed by people who didn't notice you before Mm -hmm. and that's why the past in your love life does not have to equal your future no matter how long that past has been going for so far yeah there's something really beautiful <clears throat> when you meet somebody. I had this experience recently where I, you know, got to really know somebody. It's like, like I felt like I really knew them, and then eight months, nine months into knowing them, she she just shared like some really brutal shit uh-huh. about her childhood, like really brutal. And I was like, no shit, <laughs> no shit. Like the, you would expect uh-huh. that somebody would lead with that. Oh, you know, like this, I had to deal with this and this is my victim story. And, you know, this is so hard and this is why that, but it was like, she had, she wasn't hiding from it or buried, but she, that was just part of the ingredients that she dealt with. And she was making a masterpiece of her life. And then for me to go in that, I was like, it was really like this mind blowing. I was like, Wow. I'm just learning about that now, you know, how fucking cool. And And like my admiration for her was like through the roof. I was like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And the side effect of that is that you can't help but question what else (laughs) that person has up their sleeve. No, totally. Like what, (laughs) what else, (laughs) what else happened that was horrible? (laughs) Shit. I don't like. Like what do you? What else have you transmuted quietly and heroically? <laughs> yeah, not looking for yeah. any applause, not looking for like, look what I did, but just <laughs> quietly alchemized into some into some beauty that just shows. I always think about that in uh, when people are out there trying to find love and they're on dates. That we have such an emphasis on impressing over connecting, and we should flip those. Like impressing is when we go on a date and we're constantly talking about what we've done or what we've achieved, you know, who we are as a person in this world. And 
And, you know, we, we don't connect that way. And if you can hold back the urge to impress and instead just connect that effect you just talked about, that will happen naturally. Mm-hmm. Cause sooner or later, that person is going to discover these things about you that you didn't feel the need to volunteer mm-hmm. up front. And when they do find them out, the potency of that, that you didn't feel the need to like lead with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's amazing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, the people are, you know, that's like my experience of being your friend. I've just realized. I feel like every time we hang out over the years, I learn some other thing you're good at. <laughs> that I had no idea you even, that you had any ability in whatsoever. And you just casually like, I'm like, oh, you're good at that too. What a freak. <laughs> I think like one of the things that I love about friendships is I actually love, and I think this is a part of what well, I've had a just a, a I mean, I've had my challenges in love life, but I haven't, I've had a gorgeous love life history. And I think, you know, I can look back at that and yeah, all right, there's this challenges here and there and the, the, all of these different journeys. But I, in, in my friendships, beautiful, like gorgeous friendships in my life. And I think it's just because I love I love people and I love like, I'm like wildly interested in other people and their stories and like who they are and their unique like signature and like what's going on. And also like love when they get to see some, like some flash of that unique essence, not the accolades or what Uh are done, but like the actual, like the magic that's in there. And, and that's, uh, that's something to really like, like live for, you know? And I think navigating to that as quickly as possible with people is, is, is really what I like to do. Where it's just like, how do you just clear all the, I I just, I can't be bothered with the small talk kind of environment. It's like, let's go to the deep end. Do you have any interesting ways that you do that when you're talking to people? Like what? Do, what's what's your kind of method for avoiding the small talk in general? There's a a kind of deeply penetrating presence that I that I try to like lay in that actually like tries to see through. Like, so I can see through what they're saying and see underneath. And it's almost like an unspoken invitation for that. It's not like a trick of words or just the right question. But I try to create an environment where like, we're like, we're going in like a little deeper and a little deeper. And that's, that's why I like containers that, that are set up for that, where people are not expecting. I hate like the you know, mixers and social fucking gatherings. Right? It's, it's, it's like a nightmare for me. Yeah, me too. It's a fucking nightmare. Yeah, I and I, like, I could just, I can't, I can't do it unless I can find my way to find somebody and then just drop in. What do you do when you get invited to something like that? <laughs> Decline? <laughs> I mean, I- I dread I, it. Whenever I get invited to something like that, I just think this is a thing in my month that I don't want. Like I just, I know that this is going to require such disproportionate effort yeah. from me to leave the house and go to this place full of strangers and have frivolous conversation. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm attracted to depth. I'm just, I'm just wildly attracted to depth and whatever, whatever shows up in that depth, I'm like, I find myself allured to it. And so like my own natural allurement to the, to the depth is I think, you know, one of the key, you know, signatures for me is it's just like, I like the deep end of the pool. Yeah. And if we're going to be, so there's certain times where people, they don't like, they don't like going in the deep end. So in the situation where people don't like going in the deep end, then I'll find a game we can play right like some like we'll play all right 
you want to play bags or you want to play darts or you want to play pool or like we, we if we're going to do something and just bide our time I like let's that. compete and we'll talk shit and you'll find a game there must be some axes around here somewhere <laughs> yeah, exactly so so my two strategies are either a game or depth and i avoid all the other thing else like if we're gonna i don't want to play the game of of talking about nonsense that doesn't really matter like that's not interesting to me. Like I want to play the game of like depth talking and play a game. Like, you know, Chris Williamson's here in the studio. I love playing pickleball with him, not because he's good at pickleball. He's fairly average, I'd say <laughs> right. mediocre, mediocre player. <clears throat> and <laughs> but we not only get to play a game, but then in the between the games, Chris is a master at talking about depth. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's like, I light up when I see that motherfucker, you know, not because of his mediocre pickleball game, no, but because of his depth in between, in between. Right. You suffer and, through the pickleball and also, if you've, for the depth. If you've lost to Chris Williamson in pickleball, I just want you to know you're worse than mediocre, whoever you are listening right now. <laughs> <laughs> But that's but that's it. Then those are the type of, and I think that's one of the reasons why you know we've been friends. It's one of the reasons why the experience we went through with Wim Hof was so potent too, because we got into the depth. You know, like we got into the depth with each other. And once you get into the depth, you know somebody, and there's a bond that's formed that's just fucking different. You know, so I love those initiatic practices, those things that drive you into depth. I think it's one of the reasons why Fit for Service has been so successful is because we do initiatic practices like shamanic breath work and mm -hmm. lodge ceremonies or or ecstatic dances or things that bring people or even just communication technologies that drive you into like deeper depth. And then people are like, oh, fuck, I'm not alone. When you're when you don't have those kinds of thick tools at your disposal, and you're just speaking to someone, do you try to access that depth with, with them, and that slip into that presence you're talking about by just slowing down, making better eye contact than ninety percent of humans ever make? Like, what what do you do to try to create an environment where someone can go deep like that? Yeah, I'm looking for I, I look for openings, and sometimes they're not there. And I'll move, and and so I'll I'm scanning, but there may be just some little thing that I can see, something that I can notice. It's about really observation and awareness at like a really high level. Like, mm. well, the way you said that, like, there's something that hurts underneath that, or there's something that's really exciting about that for you. What is like, what is that thing? Like, I try to find. I try to find the subtext beneath the text mm -hmm. and I'm like scanning for that. And if I can't find it, then it's like, let's play shame ball, yeah. you know, like let's <laughs> go, let's move on. And, and you know, and, and so I'm, I'm like always navigating towards one or the other. I actually haven't been consciously aware. This conversation is really making me aware, but that's exactly how it goes. It's either like, immediately steering into games you know like within five minutes it'll be like what games do we have here to play everybody Dude, that's so there's something so funny about you're either talking about like truly existential <laughs> subject matter or you're playing cornhole <laughs> yeah exactly exactly no, and i'm actually happy no with between. either no in between i just can't bear it I fucking so can't really bear it. That's One of your inferno. audience must be able to create some kind of fun artistic meme out of that. Just you on one side, like your head exploding with ideas and just you on the other side, just <laughs> <laughs> playing cornhole. <laughs> yeah. How have, you dealt, how have you dealt with that, the harsh voice inside your own, inside your own head? You know, like I'm, I've, I wrestle with this, you know, and my failures, my defeats, my, I mean, <laughs> like constantly and even things that don't really matter but and it's part of what i think brings out my greatness because i always i'm competitive like that and i like my competitiveness mm. but i also it can also turn really dark against me and it can really like start to start to tear me down and also keep me from keep me from shining if i let it 
go. How have you, how have you dealt with that voice in your head that beats you up and kicks your ass? Um, I was talking to me and Chris were literally talking about this today because it's, I think it's a very, it's such a common voice for so many people. And mine has been like really brutal uh, in my life. There's a moment, I'm going to see if I can find it. This isn't numbered correctly, but there's a, there's a thing in here that I think is interesting for this. Um, here we go. Um, there's a, there was a, a moment where Nikki Glazer in an interview with Rogan, actually, she mm -hmm. started talking about like orgasms. And she said, I've always been into being tied up. I'm someone who doesn't feel like I deserve pleasure without having pain. Like I don't ever celebrate something. I can only celebrate or relax if I put in so much work that I'm dead. It's really hard for me to enjoy myself in life. I have to punish myself first. And so orgasms is hard for me to give myself one and let myself have that much. It's too much. It's like Christmas. You have to wait a year for Christmas. You can't have Christmas every day. So I like to be tied up and forced to have Christmas. <laughs> then I wrote, some of this may see, may, some may see in this a shocking description of what she feels she has to go through for the privilege of having an orgasm. I see the way so many of us live our lives. I struggle to believe I'm worthy of moments of joy and peace without first putting myself through a brutal schedule, monitoring my productivity levels down to the minute. Some people apply this earn your cookie mindset in ways that lead to healthy achievements. Not me. Mine is a mutation whereby joy and self-compassion are regularly outlawed by an internal tyrant who decides when I've been flogged enough for one day. Just when I'm about to collapse, a voice inside says, okay, give him an hour of peace before bed, but make sure he knows we'll start again bright and early in the morning. Hmm. That's essentially been my life. And one of the, I, I've had to really work to find roots to self-compassion. And I know some people may need to find roots to pushing themselves harder that was never my yeah challenge it was yeah. always the reverse for me is like how do i stop living with this maniac like what what can i do to change this and the the big realization for me was a kind of redefining of what self love looked like like i i truly believe that self love needs a rebrand Mm -hmm. that we have gotten it wrong in so many of the ways that we talk about it. Um, firstly, it, it, self-love has to somehow be more or deeper than, you know, a bubble bath and some candles. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's not self-care. It's right. different. And I'm curious to know where you ended up with this. For me... I started like almost running my own experiments, trying to figure out like what, where does self-love really come from? Like what, what does it look like? And, and why, <laughs> why love yourself? Like what, what is that? And I started asking audiences, like, why should you love yourself? And people would say, well, because it's a harder question to answer for most people. They, if you say, should you love yourself? They'll be like, yeah, that's really important. But why? That stumps people. So then people would give me answers like, well, because we deserve it. And I say, but why? And they say, well, because I'm loving and kind and generous and I'm good to my family and this and that, and I'm hardworking. And that immediately, I, that to me didn't work. Mm. Cause I'm like, well then what about the days where you're not those things? Do you not deserve love on those days? Like this feels a lot like telling a kid they get love for getting A's. Right. And by the way, what about when you find someone who has more of those things? Are they more worthy of love than you? Because there's someone who does generosity better than you. There's someone who works harder than you. 
So now we're into, I, I deserve love, but not as much as that person. So then people would, they would sense that there were like trap doors to this and they'd go, well, uh, well, I should love myself because I'm special. And aside from the fact that that exchange is one kind of aphorism, one generic answer for another, I would say, but is everyone special? And they'd say, well, yeah, of course. I'd say, so then if there's 8 billion people on this earth and they're all special, then it kind of feels like none of us are. Like what, when we say we're special, what does that actually mean? What began to occur to me is that we try to love ourselves through the wrong model. The romantic model of love does not work for self-love. Mm-hmm. The romantic model is there are certain things I like about you or admire about you or I find fascinating about you or I find sexy about you or, and I start to fall in love with you. But we don't experience ourselves that way. Right? If, if familiarity breeds contempt, and that's why a lot of long-term relationships suffer or end is because people get way too familiar with each other and they take each other for granted. When it comes to ourselves, who would we have more contempt for than the person we've spent every second of our lives with since the day we were born? So this idea that we're going to at some point fall in love with ourselves, it just doesn't work. And I think it makes a lot of people feel inadequate for being unable to do so. So I started looking for other models of love that don't fit that kind of a model. And one of them was the parent-child relationship, where if you say to a parent, why do you love your child? Most parents don't start reeling off a bunch of characteristics about their child. They'll just look at you strangely and say, because they're my child. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Because she's mine. Well, he's mine. That for me was a clue. And I started looking for that dynamic in other areas. So, you know, you can find it with, you can find it with a child and a stuffed toy. If you take like a kid with a stuffed rabbit and that rabbit is beat up. It smells, been dropped in a thousand puddles, it's missing an ear, it's fluff coming out the seams. If you say to that child, do you want to exchange this rabbit for this new expensive one that I got you? They'll be like, what do you, no, it's my rabbit. Give me my rabbit. People are like that with their pets. You walk down there, there are some ugly dogs around. You walk down the st street and you see a dog with this just missing all of its fur. It's like its tongues hanging out to the side. It's got no teeth. And you say to that dog owner, why do you, why do you love your dog? You'd be like, what are you talking about? It's my dog. If you said, I, do you want to exchange it for this pedigree expensive dog? They wouldn't be interested. This is my dog. That for me was a complete game changer of a realization because it showed me there was a kind of love that already existed in lots of different dynamics in this world that could be applied to yourself. Now, how do you apply that love to yourself? Well, you realize that firstly, if you say you love people and you care about people, then you deserve at least as much decency as anyone else you would give it to. Like, let's just start there. You're a person. I, I, don't, I often think we don't think of ourselves as a person. We think of like, I'm a, like just eyes looking out onto the world in this body I dress every day. But we're as much a person in the room as anybody else. So even just by that rationale, we deserve to give ourselves as much decency as we give anyone else. But it's actually much more interesting than that. Of the 8 billion people on this planet, we are the only person that is responsible for taking care of this human. No one else. It's like imagining at birth you were given a human and you were told, this is yeah. yours to take care of forever. 
Now, someone else had the job of raising you, ushering you into adulthood, keeping you alive in those early years. They may not have done a good job or they may have done a good job, but it was their job to keep you alive. What no one told us at a certain point is that in the changeover, it was our job now to take on custody of that human being. And we've had one job ever since. And that is give this human the best life you can give this human. Take care of them, nurture them, stand up for them, help them actualize, help them have a great time. Like your job is to take care of this human. That when then I imagined someone asking me, why do you love yourself? By that rationale, I would go, it has nothing to do with who I am or what I have or what I've, what traits I have, what personality traits, any of that it has no to do with, nothing to do with how I match up with anyone else. I love myself because I'm mine. Mm -hmm. I'm my human. Mm -hmm. Like that I don't, and as the comparison through that lens makes absolutely no sense because I don't, I can't exchange this human for another one. Yeah. I'm the only human I get. So my only job in this world is take care of this one human. So to your question, when I am being horrible to myself, when I'm being a tyrant, what I say to myself is, where have you been? You had one job. You had one job. Take care of this human. Look what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. What is this? Mm -hmm. That's for me. That for that changed the whole thing. That's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. I think one of the ways that you can look at this too is to have, I have through my own spiritual practices and journeys, a real connection with the mother and the mm. father. You know, the, the divine form of the mother and the father. And I know their love for me. You're my Aubrey. Huh. You're my Aubrey. I love you. Tell me your story. Tell me your story, Aubrey. You know? That's like, really beautiful. Like the father says, like, you're my Aubrey. And the mother says, you're my Aubrey. And like to know, to know that the mother and father love me like that. And then to say, oh, now, you know, I'm in charge of that. And if I'm ever beating myself up to know, like, the mother and the father, what are you doing to my Aubrey? <laughs> what are you doing to my Aubrey? You're like, how dare you? That's my Aubrey. Don't uh, you dare you. abuse my Aubrey. Don't you dare. That's my Aubrey. It's only one like him. It's my son. It's a what and and to feel like you're a welcome child in the universe. And to know that the mother and the father, God, if you will, just loves you like that. And and is saying to you constantly, like, Tell me more, son. Tell me more. Show me more. Mm -hmm. Live your story. Live your unique story. There's no one else like you. Only you can live your unique story and just fucking live it. And and that, you know, I doesn't mean I don't lose my way, but that's how I find my way home. It's stunning. And what strikes me about that is the voice that you use when you talk to yourself in that way and when you picture the mother or the father saying that to you that's my yeah. aubrey there's a very intentional and specific voice that you use for that and it's a when the voice that we've spoken to ourselves to inside is completely different from that it's like the polar opposite it's like sunshine to get mm -hmm. a, an external voice, even if you know, that's a voice that you know we're telling ourselves, but it's coming from somewhere else. It it's a very very healing and corrective yeah. relationship. I was sat with um, David Kessler, who is like one of the foremost experts on grief in the world, and I was doing an interview with him for my audience. And it was all about heartbreak and how grief applies to heartbreak. And uh, I was done 
the moment he started talking. I wasn't for me. I was I was like, this is for the audience. I'm excited to ask this man questions. He started talking and my brain got hijacked because there was a voice that he was speaking in about, you know, our pain that I start, like the voice he used was so kind, mm-hmm. and so loving that it was alien to me. <laughs> it's like, I've never spoken to myself in that kind or that loving a way. And he said, he saw me welling up and like he asked me, a, he said that, he said that right there, what you're feeling is a little bit of unresolved grief. And I just broke, like it just broke me. And the more he told, I couldn't stop that entire interview. I couldn't stop welling up. And I got to the end of it and I realized there was an, this was like an externalization of a voice that I needed to hear so badly that was really alien to me in so many ways. And just to have someone model what that voice would be like, right? the way you did just then, is so powerful because we often feel incapable of using that voice for ourselves. Yeah. But when you can, you know, my version of the mother and the father is that, you know, almost standing on the outside of myself, looking at the human that I'm in charge of. Yes, exactly. But it's the same thing. It's like a, adopting a new voice that you use for yourself. Yeah. So powerful. Yeah, and and we've we've had the other voice modeled for us. We've had the you get love if you get A's voice modeled in relationships and parents and coaches. So we have all kinds of surrogates in place of the true voice of the mother and father, the true voice of the divine, of all of these surrogates that have patterned these other voices, the voice of self-criticism, the voice of judgment, the voice of you're not enough, you're not good enough, you're not, you're failing, all of these different things. And you have to listen to the voice behind that voice, like the, the voice all the way. And if you haven't made contact with that, it's gonna be really hard to find your way through. Mm. And then, you know, I, I actually learned this through some of the really challenging, this really clicked in for me in a particularly challenging ayahuasca journey where it was so difficult and so like overwhelming and painful that the voice of the mother at, at this point came in and was just like, coming through and it came through me through my voice talking to me and this is how it goes again it's my voice talking to me but it's Mm -hmm. the energy of the it was the energy of the mother and it was like it's okay sweetheart i know like i know it's hard i know i know and it's like that real compassion Mm. like i know i know i know love it's okay and then there's the other voice that's that can also be the stern voice of the mother, like, Aubrey, get up. Get up, Aubrey. Mm. Like, get up. You're strong. Like, you can do this. You can do this, my son. Like, I know, I know you can. I know you can. And like those voices, like that come through. You I know? feel it when you say it, man. Yeah. yeah. It's real. It's like it's real. Yeah. And I think we've been disconnected from spirituality because there's all kinds of ideas of God and ideas of the mother and father. And we projected all of this, but to make that true contact, it's the only way to find, to find your bearings. And, uh, and I still, again, I lose my bearings all the time, but, so, oh, me too. but ultimately yeah. that's, uh, that's the only thing that brings me back. Yeah. It's, it's funny. We come from like different experiences, but it's the, there's so much similarity in the places we've arrived at on this. Yeah. And that's what brings me back to is that it's a completely different voice than the one that I've, uh, the I, the I or life or whatever you, whatever experiences I've had have trained in me that has been pretty terrible, Mm -hmm. (laughs) pretty terrible. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, 
Has there ever been a like a crisis point for you where you thought that the the harsh voice might actually win and actually that you've thought of like I'm just fucking out of here. There was a, the the for me I had a story that I had like caused my pain myself that I hadn't taken care of myself that like anxiety and all of this that all of the ways it was just basically I'd done a number on myself and that that's why I triggered all of these symptoms that's why I had all of these things and um and I, I found that so hard to forgive I like was I truly punished myself mm -hmm. for that like mm -hmm. truly like f for years like really really just punished myself for that and that that was a thing that like for a while I sh I really deeply deeply struggled with because like I said it wasn't just the pain it was it was the real hatred I had for myself mm. that the pain would tr the problem was the pain was a trigger for that thought Mm -hmm. And the pain was always there. So there was no escape from it. It was not like, you know, sometimes I hated myself because, you know, I was having a bad day. It was just a constant stream of self-loathing that originated in this feeling of my pain is here. That means my life is over. You're frail, you're weak, you're unattractive. You're never going to achieve your dreams now and you're never going to enjoy life again. And... You it's did it all to your fault. Yeah. And that really, really messed me up. Yeah. But that really messed me up. Uh, you know, I, I, I wince, I wince at the way I was with myself during that time. Mm. Yeah. It was dark. It was, yeah. a dark. it was a very, very dark time in my life. Yeah. Scary to even, to even think about it is like a, it's a, it's a place I can't, it's almost a place I can't relate to now, but if I think, of, if I really go there, I'm like, I can go there and I can go, oh my God. Like that's, I think we have, sometimes we have a bad uh, memory for pain. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Probably why we decide to write another book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but i totally. uh we i think we have a poor pain memory a lot of the time and and it you know you forget like sometimes in those moments how how bad it was and realizing connecting with how bad it was can be a nice source of gratitude because you and and confidence because you can actually through that you can realize just how far you've come i mean what a what an insidious trap to be punishing yourself for punishing yourself right it's like it's like you get in this loop of like i hurt myself and therefore i'm going to punish myself for hurting oh, yeah. myself right yeah. and so you get stuck in that loop and then it's like it's this just twist of the so there is a voice like how could you do this to my sweet to my dear matthew like how could you how could you do this and then the then that voice of judgment comes in well you now have to pay the price for doing that but then you're still doing the same thing you're not like you're not even recognizing it's the deceiver the voice of the deceiver what i call the anti you coming in and deceiving you and actually perpetuating the cycle yeah whereas if you can just step into a place of forgiveness and say yeah that happened in the past and like i forgive myself for the transgressions against myself and i forgive and i can start from here you know we had a little conversation before we started and i'm right now i i really feel like i'm from a place of the greatest clarity i've ever been wow and i can look back at a lot of mistakes and still acknowledge the mistakes but forgive myself and say, I like where I'm at right now. And like from here forward is a new journey and a new path. And I don't have to carry the baggage and the luggage and the reparations that are need to be made internally for all of the things that I've done. Like here you are right now. It's almost, a, I like to, the thought exercise of imagine my consciousness was just beamed into my body fresh. 
right now, a new consciousness. And I check it out and I stretch and I'm like, well, hips are a little tight, but the body's pretty good and well, mine's pretty sharp. And wow, a house is really nice. Oh, my wife is beautiful and she loves me and fuck. Dude, like it's actually, so- I'm, 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 I'm good. You, it's so crazy that you say that, man. You know, I have the, ex- I have like almost an identical thing I do. <laughs> it's so crazy. I, I am, I imagine that like, what if you kind of woke up into your life today and your job was just to make the best of that life? Yeah. Like that was your only job is to make the best of that life. You've like woken up into this body today as like a soul who's woken up in this body and and that's your job is to make the best of it from here the freedom that would come with that the excitement that would come with that it's it's literally i mean it's practically identical mm-hmm. to what you just said and and one of the things that uh one of the if the, i think this will help some people as well there's an uh a section in the book on self forgiveness and there's an analogy that I use that's really helped me when it comes to forgiveness, which is like, it starts with the like thinking of your iPhone, right? And imagine like all the way back to your original iPod and how buggy it was and it frees up. And imagine like taking your brand new iPhone out of its box today and just yelling at it for all of the ways that the iPod from 10 years ago froze and was buggy. Like it would be a weird thing to do. Yeah. Now imagine that as, imagine life as a series of runners in a relay race, like the Olympics, right? The Olympics, four runners in a relay race. Each runner has a quarter of the race to run. And each runner at the end of their quarter hands the baton onto the next runner. Now, if the second runner tripped and cost them some time, the third and the fourth runner would have to run a better race as a result of the trip. But it would be weird if the third runner went home that night and started yelling at themselves in the mirror for the fact that the second runner tripped. Yeah. I think of life as we are a series of runners all in the same relay race. Now you could think of it as there's a runner that wakes up at the beginning of every year, like midnight, end of December, the runner from this year hands off the baton to the runner who's going to run next year's race. Or you could see it as like I do, which is a series of days. Like every day a new runner wakes up and that runner has the job of running their best possible race today. Yeah. And at midnight, you know, the yesterday's runner hands off the baton to me and now I go. This for me, this idea, many runners, one race, has been a real route to self-forgiveness. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Because I now get to look back on, like, I might be mad at an old runner. <laughs> I might be like, really? <laughs> I <can't>, bro. <laughs> I got to deal with this now? I got to yeah. run this race because of you? Or like, my oh, finances yeah. are here because of you or because this, whatever. But I don't look in the mirror and do that to myself. Yep. It's a big difference. Now, we there's a great line in Jurassic Park where Dr. Hammond says to one of his staff, I don't blame people for their mistakes, but I do ask that they pay for them. The difference between blame and accountability is really important for self-forgiveness. Self-forgiveness, when you say that was an old runner, you're not excusing yourself from accountability You're because you're still in the same race. Mm-hmm. So you might have to make up the time. You might have to to run a better race today because of something from before. So you take on the ownership of running the best race you can with the circumstances given to you. But blame in that context, blaming yourself today doesn't make sense through that lens. And and that has been a that recipe for self-forgiveness has allowed me to stop constantly identifying as the person from all of the worst moments in my life, integrating it the way we've talked about, you know, earlier in this, 
integrating the, those parts of me and realizing it's all part of me, but not identifying like I am the person yeah. from 10 years ago. No, that was an old runner in the same race who, frankly, the runner that woke up today has new tools, new insights, has had different mentors, has had access to more information, has uh, uh, gotten to a place where it was more ready for change. Like there's so many ingredients that today's runner is working with that the runner from five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago did not have. So again, I'm a new, op I'm a new model today. Mm -hmm. I can't judge the old runner by the new model. What I mustn't do is take the baggage and take this person, this brand new runner that woke up today and is ready to go and go, before you go, <laughs> take this suitcase and this one and this bag and this two ton weight. Okay, now have a great race. Yeah, You can't do that. Travel lightly. There's uh, one of my favorite quotes, probably my favorite quote is from Heraclitus. No man steps in the same river twice for it is not the same river and he is not the same man. I love it. Right. I love so it. like that's, and, and that's exactly <laughs> speaking to exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And it seems to me that, you know, we could create a type of ritual. All right, let's use the, you know, I love, I love your metaphor of the runners. I think that's exactly accurate, but let's just say we use the river and let's say every time you take a shower, you make this like a conscious ritual that you enter the shower as the person you were and you emerge from the shower as a new person. And it's like you've stepped in the river, the water has washed washed clean, everything like washed away all of that, all of that. And you're gonna step out and whatever you're accountable for from the previous runners is still there. Yep. Maybe you have an addictive tendency that you have to deal with. Maybe you have a circumstance, you have, it's still gonna be there. The shower's not gonna erase that, but you're a new person and you can make new choices as you come out of that. And just some way to just remind yourself of that would be really helpful. And this is just coming to me on the spot. No, I, I love that. But I like that. every fucking shower or every cold plot, whatever, whatever you wanted it to be, just be like, okay, I step in and I'm gonna emerge and now fresh from here, what am I gonna do? It's great, I love it. It's fucking cool, I, I like it. it too. I'm gonna start doing it. Yeah, <laughs> what a great shower my next shower is gonna be. <laughs> no, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Matthew, you're a fucking gem, man. This has been beautiful, brother. I love, man, our conversations. Yeah. It's off the charts. I love it. <laughs> it's great. I love it. I'm really excited to to see the, the you know, the feedback and I hope it's resonated with people. I I really do. You I'm know, sure you, you set the bar very, very high. <laughs> like your level of conversation and thinking and the way you dive into things, there's just no, there's no room for fluff with you. You just, you know, you've thought about things so hard and you've done so much work of your own. I don't know anyone else who spent five days in the dark <laughs> or done as many journeys as you or done as many different versions of, you know, uh, your own work and your own healing. It's like, man, it's inspirational. And it's, it's to, to, to watch from the sidelines is fascinating and incredible to have been able to take part in something big with you like we did in Poland is a absolute privilege. And I know the people that you have in fit for service do that because they get to experience that privilege too, of going through something with you every single year. Um, but it's such a, it's such a pleasure, man. I love it. Likewise, my brother. Likewise. It's a, uh, there's a, you know, a deep joy. Like I'll, I'll drive home tonight and I'm, I'm going to be filled with this sense, like, ah, like Matt, my brother of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Like my brother of the way. And like, we just connected again. You know, we don't talk all the time throughout the year. We'll keep in touch and a little text here or there, but then we'll see each other and we'll be like, oh yeah. yeah. I'm back. We're back. My brother of the way. I love it, man. It was awesome, man. And this book, fucking go out there, get it. And you have so many gems to share, not only about romance, but about life itself. So, well, I, uh, the, the way, uh, you know, I, Anne Lamott's uh, Bird by Bird is kind of a book about writing that's also about life. I feel like this is a book about finding love that's 
it's also about life and yep. uh for anyone who wants to get it you i mean you could get it at all the normal places you get books um barnes and noble amazon independent stores but if you go to just make sure you do this because it's it's going to be a really cool thing if you go to lovelifebook.com with the order confirmation code you can also order it from that site but if you take the order confirmation code there um you can put that in for a, an event i'm doing on may 4th and it's a event that's not open to the public it's literally just for anyone who buys a book and i hope you got a stadium bro <laughs> hey let's hope oh. <laughs> um but it's gonna be no but it will be a virtual event anyone could do it from anywhere in the world and uh and it's gonna be a really really great coaching event to pair with the book so it'll bring the book to life and it'll be a celebration and it's only happening once and and so all the details for that are at lovelifebook.com and it's free to anyone who buys a book fuck yeah let's go thanks for having me love man. you bro love you too love you guys we'll see you next week Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.